So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Maria Small is a maternal fetal medicine specialist with an interest in high-risk medical maternal conditions like hypertension, diabetes, preeclampsia, as well as being an associate professor of obstruct obstetrics and gene, uh, gyne oh my gosh, gynecology, there we go. Oh, wow. Um, at Duke University Health System. Thank goodness this is being taped. I can relive that forever. Um, she has the experience in designing care for women with high-risk gynecological and obstetrical conditions. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Maria Small. Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me here. This is actually the first time I've ever been to the state of Indiana. I, and I like it. So I'm going to take, hopefully, a little bit of a, a different approach. Um, there's no way I can um, surpass the information, the sharing we got from our, our last speaker. And I think um, he showed us how important it is to hear the stories from directly from our patients and family members related to this issue. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about assessing health disparities in maternal mortality. Have no conflicts of interest. So I'll start with, again, a bit of an overview of the epidemiology of maternal mortality, and hopefully some of it will be a reinforcement. Some, of, some things you may hear will be a little different. And then I'd also like to focus some on um, global ethnic disparities. I also do global health as well, and I want to expose you, or at least um, if you're not aware of some of the similar work that's going on in countries that are similar to ours. And then I'll also talk a little bit about narrowing the gap in health disparities and a little about our North Carolina Maternal Mortality Review Committee experience. So this is a very familiar slide to this audience by now. This is a, a old slide. You can see it's from 1987 to 2000, and it shows one of the most severe disparities in healthcare today, and that's the fourfold difference in maternal mortality between African American and white women in the United States. And I come to you again from the state of North Carolina. I don't know how many people saw the coverage of this article. Anybody? I know I can't see your hands that well, but I see a few. I almost want to say stand up, but you've already been up. So Vox published um, this, it's an online uh, publication stating black moms die in childbirth three times as often as white moms, except in the state of North Carolina. And the comment was that North Carolina was focusing on health outcomes, not on race. So I want to come back to that. So just file this. Just as a background, this is from our Green Journal, or the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and health disparities are differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, um, that are experienced by socially disadvantaged or vulnerable populations. And then health equity, as, as we've discussed, is the concept that everyone has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. It's almost like the Bill of Rights. We all have the right to um, attain our full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged because of social position or other predeter predetermined circumstances. So many of you are familiar, or most people I think in this audience are familiar with the Millennium Development Goals. So the United Nations Millennium Development Goals are a set of goals that nations set about as, um, as achievable health outcomes, achievable outcomes for economic development. And Millennium Development Goal 4 was a decrease in child mortality globally. Millennium Development Goal 5 was a decrease in 75%, um, a decrease in maternal mortality by 75% 
globally between 1990 and 2015. So one of the, the um, purposes of the MDGs was to put maternal mortality, child health, other health indices in kind of a, a context that um, policymakers, decision makers could all relate to. And as we know, when states have to compete, they um, do a little bit more successfully. When nations have to compete, they also um, do these, achieve these goals a little bit more successfully. So it's a kind of a way to force nations to identify these as priority areas and try to help achieve them on a global stage. So this is also a quote from one of the um, International Federation of Gynecology and OB directors, um, Fatala. He said, women are not dying because of a disease we cannot treat. They're dying because societies have yet to make the decision that their lives are worth saving. And this concept and this statement is one that preceded the MDGs, and it's one that, as you heard Charles Johnson say, is one that we have to still hold up today as a very important concept. So I think one of the important things about about the MDGs, again, is that um, governments are held accountable. Systems, providers, countries are held accountable to women. And another concept is the idea of promoting gender equity and empowerment for women and girls. And within that, other goals were infant mortality reduction, eradication of extreme poverty, um, environmental sustenance, and global development. Now those goals are sustainable development goals and the end point is 2030. So one of the goals for maternal mortality is to reduce global maternal mortality to 140 per 100, sorry, 70 per 100,000 live births, and no country should have a rate more than 140. So those are the goals for 2030. I think Dr. Main did a beautiful job talking about our U.S. context um, in the, in the center of a global context. So globally, maternal mortality decreased from 385 deaths per 100,000 live births to 216 in 2015. So that was about a 44% reduction. So overall, some nations met that 75% um, reduction. That was the goal of MDG5. And many nations, like ours, did not. Um, so in high-income countries, they decreased maternal mortality dramatically over the last 25 years. So most have rates that are anywhere from three to 12 per 100,000 live births. We, unfortunately, are an exception. We had, and depending upon which data source you use, um, about a 14% increase in maternal mortality over the last 25 years. And ours is, unfortunately, and this is where we should feel shame. Um, Ours is the highest rate of any of the high-income countries in the world. And he actually showed you this in a much nicer slide, but um, this is the increase in maternal mortality over the last um, 30 years, and the, this is the picture that we're dealing with in the United States right now. So just to go back to how we describe maternal mortality for, particularly for people who may be new to maternal mortality reviews to how we, how we um, discuss this um, concept. It's the number of maternal deaths over 100,000 live births. So that's the maternal mortality ratio. And the, the World Health Organization defines maternal death as the death of a woman while pregnant or up to 42 days post-delivery from any cause except accidents or trauma. The majority occur within the first six weeks postpartum. And then as you saw with conditions like late, like opioid use, many of those may occur up to a year postpartum. But the most commonly met, used metric that's, that compares across nations is that 42 days postpartum. 
And within those, we look at direct causes, which are direct obstetric causes like hemorrhage, sepsis, preeclampsia. And since, 19, since 2012, um, the WHO also includes suicides in that, that category as well, largely in order to not misclassify or undercount those deaths. And then indirect causes are those that may not be directly as a result of obstetric etiologies, but may be exacerbated by pregnancy like diabetes, obesity, cardiac disease. So the concept of pregnancy-associated mortality takes into account both those direct and indirect deaths. And those are, this is the, um, the way that we, we count, if you will, maternal mortalities in the, in the U.S. now and the way that many of our maternal mortality review committees are trained to review maternal deaths. So it's the death of a woman during pregnancy or within one year of the end of pregnancy. So in the U.S., with our CDC guidelines, we're going up to a year so that we don't miss many of those um, deaths that may be increased due to things like opioids or cardiac disease because those are important. So that's the first step to identify pregnancy-related deaths. And then pregnancy-related mortalities are the deaths that occur within one year of the end of pregnancy from a complication or a chain of events initiated by pregnancy. So you also can have the concept of a pregnancy-associated but not related death. And those are deaths that are not specifically related to pregnancy. Um, it's kind of hard to, to maybe think of, of something that may not be directly related, but um, maybe you're walking across the street and you get hit by a car. So we start with that overarching concept of pregnancy-associated mortalities, and then we look at pregnancy-related deaths, which are traditionally what are considered the direct obstetric um, mortalities, and then pregnancy-associated but not related deaths. And so our review committees and part of our focus is on looking at all pregnancy-associated mortalities. And I think Dr. Main did a great job also of describing maternal near misses, so I'll go through this a, a little bit quickly. So does everyone remember the miracle on the Hudson? Yeah, okay, good. This is not a millennial group. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you can tell I, I usually have to walk around with the um, students and residents now because adult learners, millennial adult learners, no offense to the millennials, are a little bit different and they need a little bit more um, uh, engagement, we'll call it. <laughs> so on the left is the actual crash, the airplane crash, and that's a rare, fortunately, a very rare event. And then on the right, you have the near miss. So there would have been a crash had something extraordinary not occurred. So in this case, it was the, the extraordinary action of the pilot that prevented the, um, the plane from crashing. So that's the, the near miss conceptual framework. And then I think Dr. Main also went through this very nicely. Maternal mortalities are rare, but near misses are about 100 times more common. And then this is a graph, the red line um, during hospitalizations showing an increase in um, severe morbidity or near miss maternal mortality during delivery in the United States. And we see an increase in deliveries. The red line is during hospitalization and then the blue line is postpartum. And then in, in our SMFM and ACOG, many of you may be familiar with these criteria to kind of screen for near misses at a facility-based level. They use the concept of four units of blood transfusion or admission to an ICU as proxies for identifying maternal near misses as a way to, to get a sense of how many you may have in your, your facility and then start a review process based on those. And then facilities should review all of those, but it's very important that people know just screening positive does not mean you have to identify them to JCO as a Sentinel event. So there shouldn't be a, a reluctance or hesitation to review those to help with facility-based um, changes. And so one of the important reasons 
these reviews are important is, and you just heard it from a father and you heard it from survivors, you can talk to women and find out what was their experience, what do they identify as the main barriers to care. Was it that they got poor access, that they weren't listened to? So that's one of the most powerful things about um, maternal near miss reviews as well, is that someone can actually, can actually talk to the women directly. And then insights um, can also give you information that family members may not be able to provide. So going back to the global map, the um, areas with the darker red color are the areas with the highest maternal mortality ratios, and the lighter colors are the ones um, with the lower ratios. And so you can see the sort of north-south disparity in maternal mortality and wealthy poor nation disparity in maternal mortality. So the ones with the um, very dark red color have rates as high as 1,000 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And these are the global causes of maternal mortality. I think we've already covered most of them. 99% of all maternal deaths occur in low-income countries. So bleeding, infection, eclampsia, and then um, these are the most common causes. And then this is from the US, and this is older data. Pulmonary embolisms, or PEs, like what happened to um, Serena, leading cause of maternal mortality. So Serena was a near miss maternal mortality. And then at the bottom of this table, and these are data from 2003, Cardiomyopathy was a leading cause, but not the leading cause. So keep that in mind. So this is a little bit, the table's a little bit busy from a distance here, but this is cause-specific maternal mortality in the United States, 2006 to 2010. So if you look at the, um, the images, they're blocked according to different time periods from 1987, 1990 to 2006, 2010. And the areas hemorrhage, the blue line is the highest for hemorrhage in 1987 to 1990. And then if you look now, if you look at the purple, that's 2006 to 2010. Cardiovascular conditions and cardiomyopathy are the most significant causes for maternal mortality in the US now when you look at cause-specific maternal mortality. So we've had a shift from what would have been called um, direct causes to indirect causes, or card cardiac disease essentially as one of the leading causes of maternal death in the United States. And you've actually seen this. Do you remember seeing it? This, so as you could tell, this is, this is um, a graph that we find very important in, um, in our area, and it's one, you've heard it already, basically looking at the top line, purple, again, 2005 to 2014, um, and then looking at all races and ethnicity, not the teal line, but the more, well, I guess, if you're familiar with North Carolina, the one right under it is Carolina blue, and that's Native American, and then the one below that, all races and ethnicities is Duke blue. So if you look at the top for African-American women, that's the, um, the highest rate of maternal mortality in the United States. And then if you look by age and race ethnicity, look at the orange columns. So for orange columns, the age um, greater than or equal to 40 is orange, and if you look at that second grouping, that's for non-Hispanic black women, the maternal mortality rate is comparable to some of the rates that are found in some of the poorest nations in the world. So the rate's almost 150 per 100,000 live births for African American women over the age of 40 in the United States. This is a CDC quote, 
which I think you all are familiar with this concept now, race and ethnicity are not specific risk factors for maternal mortality, but they may be markers of social, economic, access, quality of care issues. So now I mentioned I would just indulge me for a minute. I want to just go through a few of the countries that have identified similar differences and how they've approached ameliorating, ameliorating some of these disparities. So the United Kingdom has the oldest maternal mortality surveillance system in the world. They've had maternal mortality reviews since um, before 1950s, I think 1908 was the earliest one. And this is um, considered, they used to call this the confidential inquiries in maternal mortality. So they review all of the maternal deaths in the country in a confidential manner and make recommendations for maternal mortality reduction. So one of the philosophies is to, as we've, we've discussed, respect every maternal death as a woman who died before her time, as a member of a family and a member of a community. And it's beyond counting numbers um, to listening to the stories of women who died so that we can learn the lessons that may save lives of mothers and babies. And one of the main goals, of course, is to improve the standard of maternal health. So this is the, the UK Confidential inqu Inquiry. Since 2012, they've combined the maternal mortality reviews with infant mortality reviews. So I wanted to show just a few um, slides about ethnic differences in maternal mortality in the UK. Before 2003, they didn't have racial disparities in maternal mortality because they didn't look at racial disparities in maternal mortality. So when they looked by race ethnicity, they found um, women from the Caribbean and from African um, descent had high, the highest rates of maternal mortality in the UK. And overall, those rates were about two to seven times those of white women. So they tried to examine some of the factors because they go into factors that may be related to particular outcomes. They found that, um, that minority women often booked later for antenatal care. When they talked to, um, to survivors or, well, to their family members, they also described experiencing feelings of disrespect in the healthcare system. And they also reported feeling like that the staff didn't really communicate well so that they could understand um, events related to pregnancy, labor and delivery, and postpartum. So at the end of every confidential inquiry, just like at the end of most of our state maternal mortality reviews, we make recommendations. So they recommended reorganizing maternity services, specifically targeting vulnerable populations, and then again to review these, um, these outcomes. So a few of the things they recommended in their setting were making sure that the systems were universally accessible. So this is a country already with universal health care. So even in the context of having universal health care, they had these health disparities. Um, and then they also recommended women have early prenatal care. So they have booking or entry to prenatal care by 12 weeks. And for those who did not enter by 12 weeks, they made sure they had an appointment within two weeks, and then women who were from um, areas where they may not have had uh, early primary care had to have a physical examination, which included a cardiovascular examination as part of their exam. So they actually reviewed their deaths from 2003 to 2013, and overall in the UK they had a reduction from 13 to 11 but for women of African descent who had the highest maternal mortality rate, they saw the most dramatic drop in maternal mortality ratios. They also have a system of examining um, near misses as well. But when they examine near misses, it's, not, it's different from the way that we examine them. They may take a specific condition like sepsis, like amniotic fluid embolism, and then look at those over a period of time and then make recommendations on that, on that particular condition. 
Um, so they also saw an increase in maternal near misses for African and Afro-Caribbean women. They were double those of, um, of white women, even when they adjusted for age, economic status, BMI, and parity. So some unmeasured issues. So similar work has been done um, in the Netherlands. Their maternal mortality ratio um, is 12, and they actually, over time, well, more recently, they've seen an increase in cardiovascular disorders contributing to maternal mortality. In their population, the extremes of reproductive age were associated with higher rates of maternal mortality with younger women and women over 45 at highest risk, and then non-Western immigrant populations are at the highest risk. They also have a maternal mortality surveillance system. And I'm just gonna to go to the main point. Um, they identified substandard care as a contributor in 80% of the cases, and that was mainly in management of conditions like preeclampsia. And then this is um, from one of the, the authors of the work from the UK, from the Netherlands, and basically summarizing some of the data from Europe looking at the Netherlands, UK, France, and ethnic differences in maternal mortality. And they see or have shown some of the same, same issues in health disparities that we've identified for a long, quite a while in the United States. So now I'm gonna segue back to my state of North Carolina. So welcome from balmy, well, I don't know, it's 50 degrees now, North Carolina. So we have the mountains, the coast, and the Piedmont, if you all would like to come and visit us. I was born and raised in North Carolina. North Carolina actually has um, one of the oldest state pregnancy maternal mortality review committees. And in 2005, the um, committee at that time did publish information about preventability of pregnancy-related deaths in North Carolina, and we found that about 40% of the deaths in our state were preventable, and North Carolina was one of the first states to show that shift in maternal mortality causes um, as related to, to cardiovascular disease being one of the leading causes. And we also demonstrated African-American women were more likely to have preventable causes of maternal mortality. Now, all of the people in this article, for the most part, were, with the exception of the people from the CDC, were the committee. So most of them are maternal fetal medicine providers from the four different medical schools in the state of North Carolina. So the committee over time, it didn't have any funding, didn't have a legislative mandate. So over time, the committee actually kind of became one person, Maggie Harper, who's the second author. And she did almost all of the chart reviews for our state for almost a decade. Um, and worked in conjunction with our Center for Epidemiology and Statistics. So I'll tell you a little bit more about our new committee in a couple of slides. So in 19, sorry, it's another millennium, 2000. So our committee now is kind of reconstituted. Um, we started in about 2012 with funding from Merck for Mothers and the CDC. And we brought together several people who were interested in maternal mortality reviews and went to Atlanta and learned about the review process. And in um, 2014, we received our state um, um, protection from discoverability, and we also were given a legislative mandate. We actually have a very small committee. We're only nine people, and it's a combination of social workers, maternal fetal medicine providers from the, all the, the medical schools, and emergency medicine, medical examiners. But then we have consultants from other areas, um, including um, injury violence and prevention, and depending upon what cases we're reviewing from other areas. And some of the, the issues that we're having, we have a mandate, but we don't have funding for our review committee. So most of the funding is coming from our North Carolina Women's Health Branch. And we also don't have as many 
direct community stakeholders as some of the other committees around the country may have, like advocacy organizations. So those are sort of our, our primary issues. And some of the challenges that we've had with getting records we think may be related to the concerns about co confidentiality still, residual concerns with some cases. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, race, ethnicity, and near misses and maternal mortalities as it relates to my state. So in North Carolina, the Hispanic population is one of the fastest growing in the United States. We had a 300% increase in the population over the last decade, and the majority were born outside the United States. And I think some of you, are you familiar with the Hispanic paradox? Is everybody falling asleep? Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> so the Hispanic paradox is this concept that Hispanics in the United States have better health outcomes than the average population despite the um, aggregate socioeconomic determinants that would make you think otherwise. And we've seen this paradox in cardiovascular disease, preterm birth, low birth weight, infant mortality, and even maternal mortality, if you remember the slide that both Dr. Main and I showed. So the paradox is that these social determinants of health should um, mandate worse health outcomes. So women are younger, they may have later entry to prenatal care, no insurance. So in my state, women may receive um, emergency Medicaid for a short period of time, but then they don't have Medicaid throughout pregnancy if they're not um, citizens of the U.S. and have no, no means. They also have shorter interpregnancy intervals, lower levels of formal medical maternal education, and higher rates of formal employment. So some of the theories, one is the, that healthy immigrant effect, you're not going to leave your country of origin and go to another place if you're not healthy. And then another theory, maybe social network support are stronger, diet, lifestyle choices, less alcohol, tobacco, illicit drug use may be higher in, in that community. So in North Carolina, we have shown lower rates of preterm birth, infant and maternal mortality for Hispanic women than white and African American women. And this is work from my institution. But we also looked at near miss maternal mortalities in my, um, my um, Medicaid population at Duke in about 12,000 women we examine near misses. And overall, we found for African-American women, we did see higher rates of pregnancy-related comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, when compared to white and Hispanic women. But then near miss maternal mortalities in our population were higher for Hispanic women than African-American women. So these are pregnancy complications for African-American women, which are higher. But then near miss maternal mortalities were higher for Hispanic women. And then these are just the um, relative risk showing a higher rate of maternal near misses. We'll go back. So for us, we thought one of the concepts for our population was that if you come from an area where you may not know the health system, where overall you may be healthier, but if you experience an acute event and you can't necessarily communicate or you can't necessarily navigate, then perhaps that's when the near misses um, may, may be at higher rates. So that's just what we see. Hopefully others will examine their um, hospitals and settings and, and see what they also find. So let's go back to Vox. So let's see why or how North Carolina became the first state to fix the huge racial gap in maternal deaths. So the article showed that we focused on helping moms, not on race. And then they again showed us 
um, the same huge disparity nationally between African American and white women in terms of maternal deaths. Now this is actually the um, graph that appears in the Vox article. And if you look very carefully, they show from 1999 to 2013. Does anybody notice why that gap may have been narrowed some? What happens to white maternal mortality, maternal mortality for white women? Yeah, it increased. So that's not the way we want to narrow that gap. And then the other thing is, and this is something that we in the state of North Carolina, we, we and I encourage people to be cautious about. When you look at maternal deaths in a year by year period, you have really small numbers. And the numbers can be misleading and the interpretation for those numbers may be misleading. So let me show you the um, explanation and then I'll show you what happens when we look at that, those data a little bit differently. So we do have something called North Carolina Pregnancy Medical Home, which was a, one of the reasons why we were thought to have this this huge drop in maternal mortalities and a narrowing of the gap. So these are pregnancy care managers who are paired with high risk moms during pregnancy, after pregnancy. And this is a quote from our pregnancy care manager at Duke. She says, I always tell my patients, if you miss your appointment, I'm gonna call you. If you ignore me, I'm gonna send a letter. And if you ignore that, I'm showing up at your door. So, this is one of, this is the public health, the public health um, <laughs> Amen corner. See, so this is the dedication of the pregnancy care manager. And um, our local TV um, station is WRAL, and they described how pregnancy, um, met, pregnancy care managers help to reduce this, um, this gap. They actually used to have a cooler name. It used to be called the Baby Love Program. And so people would just say my baby love worker, kind of like Diana Ross, baby love. This is a little bit hard to read, but it's on our website in the North Carolina Center for Health Statistics. And it's basically an article from one of our um, North Carolina epidemiologist, and it states problems with rates based on very small numbers. So when we look at our, our maternal mortalities in, in the state of North Carolina, these are broken down into four year periods. So they're showing from 1999 to 2002 on the far right, 2011 to 2014. If you look at those comparisons, although the numbers are decreasing, that disparity in African American, which is the um, gray column, and white women still exist. So this, for us in the state, was a lesson in how we present our data, particularly on our website, and how it may be interpreted, and how people can sometimes um, reach false conclusions. And for us, we still have a lot of work to do. And on that note, you've already heard an advocate who has done much more than, um, I, I don't even know what to say, I'll just show you the pictures. So this is one I think you all probably saw that got a lot of people upset. California decided it was tired of women bleeding to death in childbirth, and Dr. Main told you what they did. So, and then one of the organizations that has been very active in advocating for African-American women is Black Mamas Matter. And they'll also have a, um, a national meeting in December in Atlanta. And one of the um, approaches that Black Mamas Matter has promoted is the idea of the human rights-based approach to maternal health that this is a human right. And maybe we should make it part of our Bill of Rights, that we have the right to health. So these are national strategies and recommendations. And I'll, I'll go through these from the um, Committee on Healthcare for the Underserved. I've newly become a member of this committee and they have some really nice articles if you haven't had a chance to look at them and they're all in the ACOG website. 
so this is specifically related to health disparities. So their recommendations were raise awareness about racial and ethnic differences and disparities, which I think we've, we've done and we continue to do. Um, understanding implicit bias and also training in implicit bias using federal standards for the collection of racial ethnic data in order to identify disparities, educate patients on steps that they can take, particularly focused on health conditions that may differentially af affect their, their health if they're from a um, racial ethnic group, and then recruitment of OBGYNs, healthcare providers from el ethnic and racial minorities into um, academic and community medicine. And I'm not gonna go back through the safety bundles. Dr. Main did that. The disparities bundle is one that I, is relatively new, but I think it's one that we should also examine. Every health system should also identify race, ethnicity, primary language, and put that information in the EMR. Tell patients why we're collecting this data, why we're trying to follow it and track, track it. Use best practices to share in decision-making with our patients, and then engage patients, family, community advocates in partnerships to help with quality and safety initiatives. So they also say with every patient, family, staff, we should have education on implicit bias. We should be able to get records quickly in a simple format. We shouldn't have to dig through multiple different screens in our EMR in order to access information. And we should also have a way for staff, and patients, families to let us know if they feel that they've had inequitable care. And responses, we should timely respond to inequity reports, address reproductive life planning, and then have discharge navigation follow-up and materials that are at the health literacy and cultural language level of our, of our patients. And each system, just like you start, you should have a monitoring process, outcome measures, quality improvement projects that target disparities, and a culture of equity. Maternal mortality reviews should continue to consider the role of race, ethnicity, poverty, literacy, and other social determinants. And that is part of the CDC's um, review package if you've used that or if you, when you use that. I say if you've used that. I know that Indiana just did its first reviews yesterday. So that's why I said, yeah, y'all get a <laughs> clap for that. So your, I understand your committee just, just formed just got the legislative mandate, and while I was here yesterday, you were doing your first set of reviews, so I feel like that was special. I was meant to be here. <laughs> so in the um, review sheet, use the checkbox that identifies whether race, ethnicity, language, social determinants contributed to the death, and then if so, what system changes would you recommend? And those should come from each, each committee, each um, hospital. And then I'll end with this, the case for National Maternal Mortality Review Committee. As we've discussed, we have the highest maternal mortality ratio of any wealthy country. And Dr. Clark and Dr. Belfort in this article said this is a national disgrace and a human rights crisis. So we have an absence or lack of data on disparities, regionalization, transport, training. Um, many of us need assistance support with um, administrative data versus reviews because when we look at data coming from things like um, death certificates and when we do reviews, a lot of times those, those um, don't match. And we need to be able to have a national review process similar to what the UK has, we should really have that. 
And at the end, they said it will literally take an act of Congress. And I think you already heard that there are two bills in Congress that we should encourage our legislatures to act on. Um, House Bill 1318 and the Senate Bill um, 112. So with that, thank you. And I think we'll be around to ask questions later, but I want a picture of your, you all. I'm so impressed by so many people <laughs> who are here and just the magnitude of this audience for these issues. It's really, really, North Carolina, I've got to send this home because North Carolina has to, we gotta get on it because you all are showing us the way. <laughs> Thank you.